Good afternoon. We're, we will get started. So is there anyone in the audience who doesn't know what this is? Anyone who doesn't know what it is? Right. Everybody knows it's the bridge over San Francisco Bay, right? <laughs> Except it's the East River in New York. And uh, those of you who've been here many times uh, appreciate this is sort of the logo of this course. It's an effort to sort of bridge exciting advances in major health problems, diseases, and so forth with the state of the art of where more reductionist science is. And today is an excellent example of it. So. If everybody looks at this, I wonder if we're all seeing the same thing. And I wonder how many people look at this famous painting by Klimt and like it, and others don't like it. Why? Are we all seeing the, the fact those are probably maybe sperm on the male's coat? and eggs on the females? I don't know. Maybe it isn't. But some people would look at it and see it that way. Uh, Freud did. At any rate, in thinking about today's subject, it is a fascinating, one of the most fascinating aspects of, of human biology is, is vision. And the thoughts that naturally come to mind is, you know, how does the brain process visual images? When you look at that painting, is the brain actually replicating that painting? It appears on the retina, but is that the way it appears in the brain? Do we see the same thing? As somebody said, is the brain a picture book? You know, you take a picture and there it is on the back. Or as somebody wrote, the brain can create a visual system where fantasy, the input of the central nervous system, coincides with reality, meaning we aren't all seeing the same thing. So the pathway goes from the retina to the thalamus to the occipital cortex and then to many, many different areas of the brain, particularly in the frontal, temporal, occipital lobes. And each relay back and forth transforms with the images. Incredible. And this complex system is obviously deranged in both acquired diseases and inheritable diseases. And it's one of the more extraordinary uh, aspects of human biology. So on, the, on our website, uh, we list through courtesy of our speakers, uh, several journal references of summaries of the state of the art of of vision research and some related diseases. But I thought that those of you who are not specifically uh, interested in ophthalmology, for example, or physiology of the eye, might be interested in these references, which are non-journal and are really extraordinary bits of literature, which in terms of getting the message across, uh, is more pleasant to read <laughs> than it may be to wade through a more technical journal. So Oliver Sacks has written three amazing short books uh, which deal with vision through the format of patients who have selected abnormalities and the value of that in translating back into uh, neurophysiology. And Eric Kandel's most recent book, The Age of Insight, is really a masterpiece with regard to this. And I would recommend that, that you all get a chance to read it at some point because it's really a very fascinating thing. At any rate, so today, uh, originally, we were going to have uh, uh, five people involved in today's presentations. A patient who unfortunately cannot be with us in person, but will appear in video. And Dr. Emily Chu, 
people who is going to interview the patient, but no patient, no interview, but will benefit from her presence. Our two speakers and the third person uh, is a man who 170 years before Darwin uh, described the clinical entity of visual hallucinations that you will see and hear discussed this afternoon, Charles Bonet. So I was fascinated in reading a little bit about him. He was a lawyer, and he kicked the law habit and got interested in insects. And much like E.O. Wilson, the famous insect naturalist at Harvard, uh, he observed behavior and development and wrote about them. Now, that was the days of metaphysical philosophy. It's 150 years before Darwin. And he uses the interesting term evolution that the insects evolve in different shapes, forms, directions, habits, and so forth. So he led a lonely life, but his contributions were extraordinary. And you'll hear about the thing for which he is perhaps best known and where his name continues. So our two speakers today, the first is Edmund, uh, Edmund Fitzgibbon. Uh, who's a neuro-ophthalmologist in the Eye Institute Laboratory of Sensory Motor Research. So Edmund took a degree in physics uh, at uh, Cornell and then went to medical school uh, at Albany Medical School. Uh, and after an internship, he took an ophthalmology residency and then continued as a postdoctoral fellow He's been at the NEI since 1984, and his work has involved uh, seeing patients with various types of central form of uh, visual disturbances. So Ed is going to speak first, and then he will be followed. Let me check my notes here. <clears throat> by David Leopold, who's a senior investigator in the section on cognitive neurophysiology and imaging at NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, and it's in the Laboratory of Neuropsychology. Uh, David's training before coming to the NIH was in biomedical engineering at Duke and then a PhD in neurosciences at Baylor. He did postdoctoral work at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, Germany. He came to NIH in 2004, and he has a core facility for brain imaging in non-human primates, and that's going to be the main area of his discussion today because the studies in the non-human primates really led the way and continue to in trying to help understand the complexities of the central nervous system effects on, on imaging. Uh, he's chief of the section on cognitive neurophysiology and imaging uh, and uh, director of the neurophysiology imaging facility, which is a joint facility among several institutes. So, Edwin, if you would kindly begin. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, what I was asked to talk about was cerebral pathways and disease. And today we'll start with a video. It's of a patient. Unfortunately, the patient that we had, let's see if this works, um, wasn't able to attend. She's a caregiver. Her husband wasn't doing well. Um, we'll do a, a kind of a world, whirlwind tour of the visual system from the retinas to the occipital cortex and then beyond the visual cortex. Talk a bit about some unusual visual problems and then David's going to talk about blind sight. So here's the video. It's from Shirley Ray who is a neuro-ophthalmologist at Harvard and she's interviewing a patient and you'll see in a moment. 
This patient has something called release hallucinations, and as... This lady is age 78, and Helen, you've been in the hospital now for how long? Three days. And why did you come in? I came in to, <coughs> to find out why I was seeing floating images. Can you describe the images for us? Well, first of all, the first image I saw was a black cloud, and it looked, uh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't too large, and, um... It looked somewhat like a screen with, and so on. And it would disappear when I'm, um, uh, after I'd washed my face and hands and, and cleaned up in the morning. Uh -huh. And then I wouldn't see it anymore. But then came this time and, and the images were, were frequent. And what did, they, what did they look like? Well, then afterwards, uh, it was roses or begonias. Uh -huh. They were pink. They were, they were very lovely pink with yellow centers. And um, uh, they came in clusters, in, in like a spray. Yes. That you might get at a funeral or something like that, although no ribbon on it. And uh, they just floated. And were they normal in size, like the real yes. flower? Yes, as a matter of fact, the roses were about that much around. They were good-sized roses. They were all very, very fully, uh, full blooms. Right. Now, did they fill your entire vision? No, no. They would be floating. They would be floating. They'd be floating on the ceiling, floating, floating. But wherever my eyes went, they floated. I see. And after a while, they disappear. Now, could you see them with your eyes closed? No, not as a rule. Uh, I, it seems to me that once or twice I did, but uh, uh, no, not as well, no. Now, have you seen any other pictures? Yes, I've seen, uh, I've seen the rose begonia. I've, I've seen uh, limbs with leaves on them, and um, uh, <clears throat> then, uh, oh yes, I saw women, uh, women with dust caps on. Really? And the, uh, uh, the, the, it was an older woman with uh, some younger women, but they were still grown up, well grown up. And um, uh, then uh, the, the woman with the, uh, who seemed to be the, the, in front of the group was a plump, very plump person, plump all over, very. And uh, then I saw some girls, and they were, they were pretty girls. They were like in their early 20s with very frilly dresses with ruffles across here, ruffles on the bottom, nipped in waist. And one of them, as a matter of fact, did a couple of steps like with one foot. foot. And they were also normal in size. Yeah, they were normal in size. Now, it, the women were dressed in pink, but the um, girls were dressed in yellow. They, that's one place where the color differed. Mm. Now, every so often, I, I have seen um, uh, green, oh, like a, a wreath, and it's been green. And I've also seen green, almost a square of green. Uh, there's leaves tightly packed. Right. And they are floating. Yes. And I've seen, I've seen some men also. And... Uh, uh, now, uh, this morning sometime, I even saw some snow where people were walking in snow. Uh-huh. I hadn't seen that before. Now, you're telling me all this without appearing afraid or scared about it. Oh, I'm trying not to be. Did it scare you right at the beginning? No, it didn't really. It just makes me feel bad that I'm sick. Uh-huh. It's my, um, um, my sister had a stroke two years ago, and I've been going up to take care of, care of her three or four days a week, and she, she hasn't got me. Right. Okay. When you're looking at me, do I look perfectly normal? Yes. Do you see any images obscuring my no. face? Uh, not at the moment, but a few, a few seconds ago now, or whatever, there, well, now, now there's grass. Uh, there was... Um, um, uh, bran some branches, about the same shape as that some of the things come in, and uh, they were uh, green leaves. And now the branches are more slender, and with green leaves, uh -huh. and they're still on your forehead. Uh -huh. 
Are you a gardener? Yes. Very keen gardener, are you? <laughs> they always said you can take the girl out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the girl. I was brought up in Billerick on uh -huh. a farm. Were you? Yeah. Yes. We had 10 acres. Uh -huh. Orchard, everything. Lovely. Let me ask you, have you ever seen an image that you just looked at? For example, if you're watching something on television and then you moved your eyes, went into another room, could you see that television image again? Oh, no. No. That, that has never happened. Okay. Never. And you've never seen uh, images that look distorted, either too big or too small? No, they're always normal. Good. And colors you're obviously very in tune with because of the pink images. What color would you say the top of that bottle is? Red. Very good. And this one? Green. So although your vision has been impaired with glaucoma, is that right? Mm -hmm. And with cataracts, mm -hmm. Up until recently, you were able to read a lot, is that correct? And drive. And I drive. drive. Oh, when I was driving back from the uh, Leahy Clinic, by the way, the, on, on a week ago, Thursday, actually, was when I, 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 I went in again on Thursday. Um, all the way home, I, I wasn't driving, I had, had to take a cab. All the way home, I saw red, bright red, buildings that looked like a penitentiary and they had irregular windows some big some small some they irregularly spaced uh -huh. everything but I saw those all the way home uh -huh. it's the same the same buildings all along the route and it's about six or seven miles from uh, Winchester from uh, yeah no I guess uh, that's in Burlington uh, to the to the mid the line but this isn't a building you know no this no, was no, 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 never, oh, there isn't any right. such building. There. Exactly. <laughs> no, right. Such a regular window. Yes. Okay. Do you get migraine? No, never. Have you ever had a seizure? No. No. Good. Well, I thank you again. Oh, you are uh, so welcome. Thank you so much. So, obviously, she had a lot of interesting um, comments to say. It, what she has is something called release hallucinations. And we're going to talk about that later. Another name for it is Charles Bonnet syndrome, at, at, as Wynn was alluding to. Um, I want to do a quick summary of how vision gets back to the back part of the brain and then goes from there to some of these weirder types of things. So light comes in the eye, gets focused in the back of the eye. Here's a, a schematic of the retina. The light comes through the retina, which is transparent, gets transduced in these photoreceptors, percolates through the retina, which does a lot of processing, and then comes out on these ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are different types. There's, um, it'll come up in a bit. Um, there's an M and a P type. And here's a picture of the retina, again, a drawing. This is the optic nerve head. These are the blood vessels. The part that we use to see, the part that has the best vision, which is called the fovea, is right here. There's a part here that just the, is the midline, it's the horizontal raffae. These arcuate fibers that are coming from photoreceptors um, respect that horizontal meridian. None of them cross it, and that'll become important in a minute. Um, one of the tests that op neuro-ophthalmologists do that they all love is, is this thing called the swinging light test. It's, it's easy. What it's doing is trying to figure out, is there a difference in how much each eye sees? So if you put a light in one eye, just because there's a consensual reflex, both eyes constrict. If you move it to the other eye, hopefully both eyes constrict also. But say that I put it in the right eye, it constricts, I move it over to the right eye, it dilates a little bit. What it's saying is that left eye that dilated a little bit isn't seeing as much light as the right eye. Now they could both be abnormal, it's just that the left would be more abnormal. So it's a relative kind of thing, but it's, it's a test that's used all the time. Here's a schematic of how the visual pathways work. So just concentrate, we'll start on the, on the right side. This is the right visual field, the red, the left visual field is the blue. The same, both eyes are seeing the same thing. The interesting thing though is this, here's the right visual field. Because of the lens in the eye, it projects to the left retina in both eyes. And those pathways, here it's coming from the right eye, it crosses over in this area called the optic chiasm goes back to the geniculate along with fibers from the temporal left retina, this side here. 
they, at the geniculate, they both go back and go along the geniculocalcarin tract to striate cortex. So that's, that's the main pathway. Now, I talked about different kinds of ganglion cells. There's some that are parvocellular, some that are coniocellular, some that are magnocellular. This is what, what the person's looking at, and this is you know, a pictorial view of what each of these types of, of cells might be carrying, the signals they carry. Parvocellular tend to be static. Um, it, it carries color, it's high resolution, it's form. The, the magnocellular is black and white, it's low resolution, but it ca carries motion. And the coniocellular is, is more for blue cones. This is a complicated slide. I don't want you to really read it. The only things I want to point out is that the, the lateral geniculate has a really intricate structure. It has six lamina, different, different fibers from different uh, parts of these components, synapse at different parts of this. Um, the ones that are interesting to, to mention, again, are the M fibers, the magnocellular, that carry motion, form, and monochromatic brightness, and the parvocellular color, color, shape, texture, and depth information. And that, that gets carried on to the back part of the brain. Here's just another view from a different angle. And I, the reason I'm, I'm showing this one is partly because it shows some subcortical structures. So here's the right visual field again, projecting to both, both the left part or the, the temporal here, nasal part here, of retinas. And it goes back here, the right eye is crossing over in the chiasm, goes back to the lateral geniculate. It's hard to see, but there's a little pathway going down here to the superior colliculus and up here to the pulvinar. These subcortical structures have some visual afferents also, and that, that is important for stuff that David talks about. Um, and then from, I lost my mouse. From the lateral geniculate here, we have the optic radiations going back to striate cortex. Same thing, another picture, just the base of the brain. They took away the cerebellum. They, they cleaned it up a bit. Here's the cut optic nerve. Here's the chiasm. Here's going to the lateral geniculate. Superior colliculus is here. Here are the radiations coming from the geniculate. Sorry, yes, the geniculate back to striate cortex. Um, here's the calcular and fissure of the striate cortex. So neuro-ophthalmologists like to localize where's the problem, actually neurologists in general. Um, the way we do it mostly is with visual fields. So one possibility is with confrontation, just holding up hands, trying to figure out what can you see with either eye. Um, another way is with static threshold. So lights are, are presented, the, the patient buzzes when he hears, when he sees it. The, thresh, the thresholding comes about when if they, could, if they see it, it makes it, it makes it dimmer. If they don't see it, it makes it brighter. At some point, it's just add threshold, and that's what it records. Kinetic, you're just making a contour map. You're bringing lights in from the side and making a mark when, you, when the patient buzzes. And these are for different size and different brightness um, image, um, images that are being shown, lights that are being shown. So I talked about pre-chiasmal, chiasmal, post-chiasmal. Post um, sorry, right here. These are the possibilities that we're going to discuss. Pre-chiasmal you're going to get something that's going to be just in one eye. It might be in both if it's something like glaucoma. But it will respect the horizontal meridian, and the fields themselves aren't going to be congruous. Um, and it could be due to lots of things, cornea problems, retina problems, optic nerve head like glaucoma. Um, it could be an optic nerve like compression or mu multiple sclerosis. At the chiasm, where, the two, two, where all the fibers are crossing, it's right where the pituitary is, and if the pituitary gets big, with, say with a pituitary tumor, it can compress this part, and you end up getting a bitemporal field defect. So it's, it's knocking out the crossing fibers, so those are the ones that you, you end up not seeing. And if that's the case, you might have to see your friendly neurosurgeon. Um, retrochiasmal behind the chiasm, so you're going to have vision loss on the same side because those fibers are now all crossed. It will be on the right or the left half sides, and it will respect the vertical meridian. If it's left brain, if, if you have right visual field loss, it will reflect left brain involvement. Superior vision loss will reflect inferior brain involvement. The more congruous, the more same shape it is, the more posterior it is. This, this is just illustrating the same thing. You know, you knock it off here, you'll get just the right eye involved. Here is something called junctional. It's getting this eye plus a little bit of the crossing fibers. At the crossing fibers, it's the bitemporal we had before. Here at four, 
It's this field here, which is a hemianopic field. Five, you're just getting the inferior, inferior fibers, so you're going to get a superior field defect. We'll skip six. Um, seven, it's a superior, and you'll end up with an inferior field defect. And at the back, it's occipital cortex, and if you knock that out, you might get a, what's called a macular sparing, this little area here, or you might not. It might be macular splitting. So what can cause some of these visual pathway loss? Well, things like stroke, tumor, inflammation, degenerations, um, arteriovenous malformations, trauma. And how do we diagnose it? Well, neuroimaging is our, our, our favorite way, um, MRI, CT and angiography. Also, it depends on what, what else is going on with the patient, the company it keeps. If I had a patient that had breast cancer and you know, had, had a um, visual field loss, you might think that they might have a um, metastasis to their brain. So just changing gears a little bit, I, I want to talk about how vision is complex. The, um, there's something called co color and con contrast constancy. So even though illumination is different, um, when I was outside, this shirt still looked blue. Here it looks blue. I could be in very dim light. I could be in bright light. I'm able to see pretty well in all these different, different light environments. And for the most part, things seem pretty much the same. Um, how do we do that? The, another thing is that I'm looking around the room because that's how we're foveate animals. We're animals that, to read, we have to look at um, a particular word to see what it is. If we're trying to pick out a street sign, we have to look at it. It's using the sensitive part of our vision. We're constantly moving our eyes around, but you have a perception of space as being a constant, um, which is really interesting. How does that work? Um, sometimes illusions can help us notice what's going on behind the scenes, and I'm going to show some examples. So here's an, an illusion that I always find really intriguing. It's, it's by Adelson. Um, the point is made that A here and B here are the same shade of gray. Now, you sort of say I'm crazy. It doesn't look like that at all. Th this one's obviously a lot brighter. If I cover everything, they really are the same shade of gray. And I'm, this isn't a trick. I'm just covering it over with blue. So how does that work? Well, A is surrounded by white, white squares. B is surrounded by black squares. And each of them looks, what, what, what this is trying to do is to make this look darker than it normally is, and this to look brighter than it normally is. The reason partly that B looks brighter than it normally is is because we know it's sitting in an area of a shadow. Also, we know A is sitting in a bright area. Those two things change our expectations, and we end up seeing something different than what really is reality. I don't know if you saw this before. This is, this is the dress that everybody goes nuts with. This is on Twitter. Um, so some people see white and white and gold and, I, and blue and black. I see something in between. But try this in the bottom. This, this was from Color Vision um, list server. This, this really looks white and gold to me. And this really looks black and blue. Um, it probably, hopefully, does to you. They're the same. Um, so it's, it's really the context that's around it that's interesting. Here, here's another one. This is always fun. It's called Change Blindness. Um, if you watch this, you, you can see it's flickering. It's going between two pictures. And actually, between the two pictures, there's a gray screen. It's about 50 milliseconds. So I think probably by now you've picked out what's happening. But I'm going to show it to you without doing the flicker in between. It's really obvious. Your eye is drawn to it there. Not so much here, though. Um, here's one that's hard. At least it took me a while. I'm fairly slow at this, though. So. Raise your hand if you see it. Anybody else? I'll point it out. It's, it's right here. Yeah, no, so it's, it's off in the corner, but it's, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's really funny. This one took me forever, and, uh, you know, but I'm slow. Um, anybody see it? Oh, got a lot of people. Okay, so, you know, I, it, I'm paying attention to these things, and I'm going, what? It's, it's right here. So, so what's going on? Um, between the two, two presentations, there's obviously change. It's called change blindness because you don't notice it, at least not very easily. Um, it's the gray screen in between that makes the difference. And 
to some extent, is wiping visual memory. And the point I'm trying to make is that the same thing happens to some extent with making refixations. So if I'm looking between here and here, my eyes move. I get a blur of, of um, visual input. It's kind of like a gray screen. In addition, there's something called saccadic suppression. Saccades are a fancy name for refixations. Um, and that's probably a different thing, but combined, you don't see these refixations that you do as, as things are going on. So changing gears a little bit more, um, here's getting into the visual association cortex. So we had a serial process going to occipital cortex, retina, optic nerve, lateral geniculate, through the radiations into V1. V1 is striate cortex, occipital cortex. They're different names for the same thing. Um, after V1, people have hypothesized these two major streams, a ventral what and a dorsal where. So ventral just means it's the anatomic term for the front and dorsal for the back. Um, and there's also, as you go higher and higher up in, in visual association cortex, you get more segregation of vision, color, motion, and faces in different areas. Um, there's this interesting problem called the binding problem. At some point, you have to put all these things together. You've, you've got these areas that um, have segregated out, say, facial recognition. How does that, so I'm looking at a red apple. How do, I, how do I, and I know the shape, and I know the color, and I know, you know, that it's, it's this. How do I put it all together as a single percept? It's not really understood how. Um, anyway, so here's a little schematic of the, of the brain primary visual cortex way back here. And then all the, the higher association areas are going to go start going forward again. And posterior parietal cortex here, inferotemporal cortex here, those are important structures. Here's the dorsal stream, the ventral stream. And here's, here's the hypothesis, that the, the dorsal pathway is a wear pathway, um, mostly magnocellular input, and it's going towards the parietal lobe. And one of, the, one of the possibilities that you get when you have this area damaged is something called visual neglect. You just neglect usually the left side of space. Um, the ventral pathway, the what pathway, um, is mostly subserved by parvocellular system. Um, it's going towards the temporal lobe. And what you get with this is agnosias. Um, so a visual agnosia, one would be, we'll talk about in a bit, is prosop agnosia. So it's inability to recognize faces. It's kind of interesting. Um, this is the same thing, um, just in a different, different picture. Here it says areas 17, 18, and 19. You, you could just, those are Broadman ca cat categories. Um, it's the same thing as saying V1, V2, V3. You have the, your um, two streams. And let's start with the ventral pathway. Going back to the retina, the P ganglion cells would project to the, to the lateral geniculate areas three to six. Um, these are parvocellular layers, then go to V1. V1 projects to lots of areas, including V2 and a lot of things. Um, but in this particular, V4 is a color area, and inferior temporal lobe is where all these agnosia kinds of things come in. The dorsal pathway going up this way, there are M-retinal ganglion cells that are projecting to the magnocellular layers of the lateral geniculate back to the bracket of the brain and occipital cortex. V5 is an area that's important for motion, and then on to the parietal lobe. So where it's, it's dealing with space, what is dealing with objects, identification, that kind of thing. So ventral stream, just as I said, um, these are all things we talked about. The, the V1 to V2 to V4, it goes on to inferior temporal cortex, and then on to angular gyrus and limbic structures. So you could get alexias, problems with reading, anomias, you just don't, you don't know what the object is, but it's because you can't name it. Um, agnosias, you don't actually know what the object is, and you don't perceive it. And amnesias, that's more of a memory thing, and that's getting it more into the limbic area. The what, it's a dorsal stream, spatial, as I said, magnocellular, V1, V3, 5, parietal and superior temporal cortex, there's this thing called balance syndrome. It's not very localizing, but people like to bring it up a lot. Um, it has to do with all these things. Simultanic nausea, really what that is, is being able to get the big picture. And we'll talk about it in a bit. And nosagnosia, not realizing that you have any problems. Um, 
difficulty reaching for objects. So these people act like they can't see when they're reaching, but they can. Um, they have acquired volitional movement of the eyes. So if you ask them to actually look at something, they, they have trouble doing it. And they tend to neglect space, usually the left. So this is a, another complex slide. I don't think it's important to look at. The, the take home message from here is V4 tends to be a more of a color processing um, area. V5, it's called MT in the monkey, and MST is a, a particular part of it, um, is the motion processing. From, as you go from V1 to V5, you tend to get more segregation. You tend to get um, larger visual fields. The area that's subserved by whatever cells you're looking at tends to be a larger area. You start getting specialized things like depth perception. Um, they're talking about binocularly driven. Um, and so here's another, this is the only reason for ever putting this up, or, or there's another one that's more typical, is just to say, wow, is this complex? Um, because nobody can read it anyway. It, down here is the eye, here's the lateral geniculate, um, here's V1, and then these are all connections in the brain that have something to do with vision. It's essentially everywhere in the brain. These are all areas that have been identified in the monkey, and, um, and there are correlates usually in the human. It's, it's a lot less easy to sort of figure it out. Here's a picture of um, visual areas in the human. What they've done is taken away the cerebellum again, and they've, they've pulled back this, this lobe. They've separated the two hemispheres. Um, you can see V1 here, V2, V3. Um, and then there's along this pathway here, same thing. It's, it's just to show you the locations. You're going more anterior again. And it's, again, those dorsal and ventral streams. So some selected diseases. Um, cortical blindness. Um, if you have bilateral occipital lesions, none of the signals are going to get past there. So they're blind. But oftentimes, there's not a whole lot of findings. So if an ophthalmologist looks at them, their eyes look fine. They don't see anything wrong with their optic nerves. And it could be misdiagnosed as functional vision loss, that they're, they're malingering. Um, the things that tend to cause this tend to do a lot of damage, stroke, severe blood loss, hypertension, carbon monoxide poisoning. That part of the brain tends to be a watershed area. So that if you, if you drop your blood pressure, it, it's more affected. Um, there's something called Anton syndrome, which is really fascinating. It, um, these people can't see. They have cortical blindness. But they confabulate. They, they say they can see. Um, they believe they can see. So if you hold up and you say, how many fingers? They'll say one. You know, or if you say, can you see this chicken under my arm? They'll say yes. <laughs> um, let's get on to uh, release hallucinations or Charles Bonnet syndrome. So as, as Wynne said, um, Charles Bonnet was a 1760 uh, Swiss, uh, who in 1760, the Swiss naturalist, described hallucinations in his grandfather who had cataracts and vision loss. And his name stuck to this particular thing. Um, it, it's, it's called release hallucinations also because it's made worse by eye closure. Um, it's felt that there's a disinhibition because of the poor vision, and that leads to the hallucinations. There's something else to be done. There's, age has something to do with it, too. 80% um, of the people who have this are over 60. That would, that would be me, too. Um, Patients realize that the hallucinations are not real, um, just as our patient did. But, but they're certainly relieved to hear that they're not going crazy. Um, and it's often a very good thing just to ask patients, do you actually have this? Because if you do, you know, it's common and don't worry about it. There's an interesting thing. Some people with hearing loss will also hear music. They'll, the songs that they've heard in the past, they'll hear. Um, this kind of thing is very difficult to treat. Um, Usually, if you can reassure them, they can live with it. It's not a bad problem. I want to talk a little bit about migraine. It's, it comes up a lot in your ophthalmology. Usually, migraine with aura, it starts out with something in the periphery. Um, and people describe motion, brightness. They're, it's hard to see in this picture, maybe, but there's these scintillating scotomatists. It's scintillating, meaning they're, they're moving and they're changing brightness. They're often colored. Um, and it's also known as fortification strata, and that's those fortified cities that were in Europe. They're, they tend to be like a 60-degree angle, and it's often an arc. The arc points towards the center. 
And with time, it, it, this is another picture of the same kind of thing. There's, there's feeling of brightness, movement, and it tends to go towards the center. It lasts about 20 to 30 minutes, tends to be stereotyped, and in the wake of where it's been, people don't see well. And then it, it gets better fairly quickly. They, they talk about it breaking up at the end. Um, here's another one of the same kinds of things. These are all people who've done this who are artists. There's another variant where people see more of a heat, heat waves. It looks like um, lines coming off of asphalt that you can see in the distance. And then that goes the same way. And wh what this is is a wave of activation across the visual cortex. And then in its wake, um, there's an area of not seeing, a scotoma. There's this odd thing that some migrant, mi migrators note is Alice in Wonderland syndrome. They either feel like they're really big or that half of their body is big or something's, something's wrong. It's a, it's a combination of spatial and um, proprioceptive kinds of problems. Again, it, it's, it's self-limited. It lasts less than half an hour. I want to talk a little bit about face recognition. This is a famous picture that was taken from the uh, Mars orbiter. And people looked at this and said, oh, look, there's a face on Mars. We just are really good at, at recognizing faces. Um, here, here's a bowl of, of vegetables. If I turn it upside down, though, you can't help but see that, that this is a, a gardener, a, a person. Um, this is the vegetable gardener. This was painted in 1590 by this guy. Here's a self-portrait, Giuseppe Archimbaldo. Um, here is one he called the, the waiter. You can see it's made out of a tanker. There's a bunch of bottles, other kinds of things. Uh, these are really fascinating. They were at the National Gallery a couple years ago. Um, here's one of, uh, it's called Vertumnus. Apparently, it's, it's, it looks like a portrait of uh, the Emperor Rudolfo. This one's called The Earth. And we can't help but see faces in all of these. And obviously, he's contrived it to make it look like that. But still, it's impressive. Here's um, pictures of Margaret Thatcher upside down. Um, doesn't look too bad. But when you turn it this way, you go, what? <laughs> the one on the right looks really abnormal. So how come you didn't notice it here? Well, all they did was they, they actually made it the correct way around, but they put them in the wrong way. So out of context, you don't notice it. But in context, you really notice it. It's, so all I'm leading up to is this thing called prosopagnosia. Um, it's an imperative ability to recognize familiar faces or to learn new faces. Um, people who have this use non-facial cues to figure out what's happening. And they're often aware of their deficit, and they can actually be socially impaired because of this. Um, Oliver Sacks wrote about it, and the, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. He actually had prosopic notion. He, he wrote an article about that, too, and the kinds of things he would use for, for clues as to who was around. There's a gamut of this. Some people are, are mildly affected, and some people are severely affected. Um, it's a ventral stream problem. Um, it's in inferior temporal cortex. You often have a, a superior homonous field defect. That's kind of expected because it's the base of the brain. You're going to get a, a, a visual field in the, the top part. But it can be a developmental defect. Um, these are the areas that people have noted um, these blue areas here and on both sides. It's a bi bi bilateral type of thing. And usually you have to have both sides affected. I talked about balance syndrome with simultanagnosia. What that means is that it's an ability to take in a whole scene. So this is a famous picture called the cookie thief, as you can see why. It's right here. But also the mother's doing this and the sink's overflowing. You ask a patient to look at this with who ha might have simultanagnosia. They'll fixate on one thing. So they'll say the mother's washing dishes and say, OK, what else? They can't see anything else. They don't notice it. Um, there's this thing called the spotlight of attention. Um, so for them, they have a very narrow spotlight of attention. It's not that their visual fields are, are very narrow. It's just that what they can attend to is very small. And this, this comes up sometimes when you do color vision testing. So I'll, you know, if I show them this and say, can you, can you name what number you see? Um, and if you're not red, green, colorblind, you can see it. It's 29. But they'll fixate on a few dots and won't be able to see the forest or the trees. So they, they can't get the big picture. Um, speaking of color vision, there's something called cerebral dyschromatopsia. Um, these are usually bilateral occipital lobe lesions. Um, 
in fusiform gyrus area. I'll show you in a picture in the next one. Um, they often have a superior quadrant or hemianopic field loss. And they, there's this thing that they can, might have hemidischromatopsy if there's unilateral involvement. It's, it's that area we were talking about before, area V4. Um, so these people complain, especially with bilateral involvement, complain about the world being washed out or that it looks like a black and white photograph. And they're really bothered by this. It's, it's interesting. Alexia without agraphia. So what it means is that you can't read, but you can write. So you ask somebody, and I've seen people do this. It's really impressive. You ask them to write something down, and they write it. OK, could you read it back to me? They can't do it. Um, <laughs> so it, it, you lost the ability to read, but can write. Um, so it's a left, t this is classic. There's other ones, too. But classically, it's a left occipital lobe and splenium of the corpus callosum. So here, where the dots are, that's the left occipital lobe. So this part's out. They have a right field defect. They have an intact left visual field um, because their right occipital lobe's working. But because this, this, where this area is, this essentially a stroke, involves some of this crossing fibers, that information can't get over to the angular gyrus. Um, sorry, let me go like this. So that information can't get over to the angular gyrus, which is used for reading um, because the corpus callosum is damaged. So they're able to write because that area is intact, but they're not able, and, and it's not really, in, in, they don't really need much more vision. It's, it's a separate area. But they can't get the, the visual information into the reading area. Sometimes these pay, people can read letter by letter, and if you give them, the way you can tell that they're doing this is if you give them really long words, they very much slow down. Um, palinopsia is, is something which is defined as palinopsia. Perseveration of vision. Um, so you get persistent or recurring um, visual images after the stimulus has been, been removed. So um, Dr. Ray was talking about, she was asking some of these questions in her um, video. So she said, if you look at the TV and look away, does that happen? She actually has another video that, she has, there's several videos online. I'll show you where to find them on, on the web because they're interesting to look at if you're interested in this type of patient. Um, so the, these kind of patients commonly have parietal occipital damage. Um, sometimes they have hemianopic field loss. And often where they have this perseveration, where they're seeing these things that are no longer there, uh, happens is in the area where they have the field loss. Um, it can also be seen in migraine and certain drugs like LSD, trazodone, topiramax, uh, to, topamax, epilepsy, and other kinds of things. But here, here's just a picture from a textbook um, showing that you can see multiple cats and multiple guy. Um, the trailing images probably are more termed polyopia, but um, the, the video that I, I don't have time to show that, that Shirley Ray did, her, what, she was, what this person had was um, an occipital lesion that was an epileptic focus. And she would be watching TV, and then she'd turn away, and, and she'd see, still see Walter Concrete. You know, it's just, this is a while ago. Um, so some, just a few more things. Uh, some other unusual visual syndromes. Um, visual neglect is really fascinating. The, these people just neglect, it's almost always the left side um, of space, and sometimes the whole left side of their body. If you ask him to draw, say, a clock on the right here, here this was a pre-drawn you know, template, and then put in the numbers and, and put the time in. This is what they did. Draw a person. You can see that the whole left side's missing. It's really weird. There's something called line bisection, where you, there's a bunch of horizontal lines on a page. You ask them to take a pen and just, just put it down the middle. They're way over to the right in all, of the, all these cases. And actually, half of the page, it's, it's just the right side of the page is being done. Um, so another one is micropsia and macropsia. This is, she was sort of talking about that, too, in the, in the video. Um, these are when objects appear smaller or larger than normal, and th that can be seen in migraine and a couple other things, epilepsy also. Th this akinetotopsia, so th we were talking about area V5, which is an, a motion area in the, in the monkey world. It's called area MT, MST. Um, these, 
this is very rare. I've only seen one patient with it. I mean, it's a rare kind of condition. It has to be bi bilateral. The person I saw had, had been in a motor vehicle accident, was, was comatose for months, um, finally came out. And, but she would describe um, standing, waiting, you know, at a street corner to cross, and a car would be far away, and then suddenly it was like right on top of her, and she, she didn't know what to do about it. Um, it, it's very strange. There's a, a well-studied patient called LM. All, the, all these well-studied patients just have two-letter names um, that had the same thing. And she, would, she described pouring coffee into a cup, and you know, suddenly it would be full, and she didn't see any of it going in. Um, so what can be done for all this? You, not a lot. Um, sometimes people get better. It depends what it is. Migraine, obviously, is self-limited. Um, Sometimes if it's from a stroke or that kind of thing, that can get better. Reassurance is helpful in things like release hallucinations. You know, drugs like anticonvulsants and um, serotonin um, up reuptake inhibitors, things like that can be tried. Usually they're not helpful. Lots of things like PT and OT can help over time. So parts of this talk came from these sources. Um, and the, this is, I said I would tell you where this was. Novel.utah.edu. It's N-O-V-E-L.utah.edu. Um, here's Shirley Ray's section, and that's where she has the movies. Um, the, the, actually, the Walsh and Hoyt, uh, there's an online version there. This is a neuro-ophthalmology website that really anybody can use. There's a patient portal. Um, it's worthwhile looking at. And I'll leave you at that and let David talk. Uh, thank you. Is this on? Oliver Sacks wrote a book called Musical Philia, in which there were some very primitive musical elements that were lost. Is the same thing possible in vision? We have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Oliver Sacks wrote a book called Musical Philia, which you mentioned. And you lose primitive things like rhythm or pitch. And uh, do you see very primitive losses, like edges between objects or something like that? Not commonly. Um, now, the, just going back to the Charles Binet, the, what she had was very unusual. She had fully formed images. Um, I don't have okay. so, so what the patient who had the Charles Binet had was, was fully formed images. That, that's really rare. What more people see is, is things that are um, either geometric or kind of like, scrub grass or that kind of, just more noisy. Um, but the edges are still there. Yeah. Edges Green. are still there, yes. Yeah. Maybe Emily, you want to comment? I could comment on the Charles Bonet syndrome. I, this is a, a glaucoma patient. I don't see glaucoma patients. I don't know there's anything specific well, about cataract. that. She had cataract, but the patients I see are with people with macular degeneration, very severe vision loss. And it's very interesting how it actually goes through a stages. They come in, they'll say they see a map of the London underground, or they see a chicken coop, or fences, or bricks. So, so geometrically, they see that very early on. And then once they've had that established, and usually hear what she says, then they go on to more, like at shrubs, they've got flowering uh, bouquets, you actually see that. And finally, it's, it's actually a, a, a face. They often see faces. And people will describe faces at the end of their bed, and, and they realize it's not real, but it's there. So it goes through this very, uh, and, and the vision hasn't changed, but they go through these, these stages, uh, and, and the rest of their vision is deteriorating because of their, of their disease. So I think it's actually very interesting. I don't know how that, I've always wanted to study how that actually goes about. Hey, <clears throat> um, So for like visual neglect patients, if they only see through one eye, what happens? No, no, they, it's a neglect of space, not, it's not vision usually. They, but they often have a hemianopsia, so that half of their visual space they're not seeing in. <clears throat> wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, individuals with chronic illness, like Alzheimer's, at some of these, like the proper obnoxia, I forgot the name of it, that you mentioned, are, are those seen in, in individuals, or is that a totally different... Um, 
type of problem, like folks who don't remember, who cannot recognize names, et cetera? Um, that, so what you're talking, yes. So when you get into dementia, it's very hard to, to sort of parse out what is what. Um, there's a form of Alzheimer's that has, it's a, called posterior um, version of Alzheimer's, that starts out more with some of these visual association cortex problems. Often they'll come to, to the doctor saying, I can't read. People fit them for glasses. They say your vision's good. Nobody ever set, tries to actually check to see if they can read. So you ask them to read, they can't read um, because they just physic they can't physically do it. They, they look at the page and they can't put it together. And that can, that'll go from there to you know, become full-blown Alzheimer's at a later date. But it's, it's starting out there and then becoming something worse. So let me ask, when we look at a painting, what do we see? I mean, you look at something as elaborate, say, as the Klimt painting that I showed with all sorts of things. Do people focus on any particular point when we look, or are we seeing an entire uh, package? And if we're focusing on a certain point, say, the eyes or the face, then different people will see the eye and the face, but not much else. Is that correct? I don't think so. I think so. There's a famous guy named Yarvis that that you've probably seen his pictures. He'll show a photograph and then he'll do, he did eye movement traces, and you can see what people are looking at. So if you show a face, it's typically the eyes and the mouth, and you can see these lines that are the traces of the line, eyes going around. You you tend to look at all of it. How you actually put it together might be different depending on the context. And I think that's where people differ. OK, any other questions? Well, we'll have time uh, after David has spoken. Thank you very much. OK, uh, can you hear me? OK, well, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak at this uh, very interesting op opportunity. And uh, to Ed for giving an uh, entire overview of all of conscious vision leaving me only the opportunity to speak about unconscious vision. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a phenomenon that Ed mentioned briefly but didn't describe, which is blind sight. Um, and blind sight is interesting, but I, I'll give you a bit of a background. Um, so this is now a sort of array of the different kinds of uh, ganglion cells in the retina. Um, and what they have in common is that they have really long axons that pass visual information into the brain. And they pass it not just to one visual center in the brain, but to many different visual centers. Um, and this is uh, coming, this is a portrait where you can study this in great detail on the mouse, but we have approximately the same diversity of retinal recipient areas in our brain. And I'm going to be talking about, and I should just say that some of these are clearly unconscious uh, in the way that they use visual light. Like, for example, resetting our circadian rhythm or controlling our pupil. But there are other, a subset of these areas, say half, that are interested not just in the amount of light, but actually in the images that are like sitting on the retina. Maybe it tells you where you should move your eyes or move your head. Um, or as we're more familiar with, maybe we can recognize a person or we can determine the shape or color of an object. The most prominent uh, pathway, this highway of visual information that takes essentially a map, almost like the film in a camera, and passes it intact back through the lateral geniculate nucleus that Ed talked about into the cerebral cortex here. That's called the, the geniculostriate uh, pathway. And in mammals, it's the main visual pathway that passes information into the largest part of the brain, the cerebral cortex. And it's particularly prominent in primates. Um, here's the human brain, um, where uh, it's basically the same pathway. It's oriented a little differently, but basically the, the connections are the same. Where uh, coming from the back of the eye here in the retina, information through about a million or so uh, neurons passes through the optic nerve and through the chiasm into the optic tract, into the LGN, and then there's one LGN on each side. There's only one that's shown here and passes information back to the primary visual cortex, or V1, which we heard quite a bit about. So that's a question of how does visual information get passed into the brain. It's through the ganglion cells and through a relay and then into the cerebral cortex. But that's not exactly the same question as how do we see. So long before people understood anything about the anatomy of the brain, uh, even the Greeks were pondering what does it actually mean to see, and they had very different theories about how we saw. But they did understand that a color, or even a, maybe a shape, or, or anything, is something that represents a meeting point between 
the actual physical world and something that you are doing and in interpreting the physical world. And, it, you know, it's not only now that we can be in a situation where we can see that there's a visual illusion. They experience these things as well. So they knew that there's some kind of paradox there. It's not simply uh, receiving physical information from the world. So <clears throat> I can probably fill up the whole, uh, you know, evening with visual illusions because we study that a lot. But I'll just give you a couple of ideas about what this means. So Ed showed a couple. Uh, one, this is kind of a neat one if you haven't seen it before. So this is an example of how visual information can enter the brain and then we can not see it. Um, if you pay attention to this green flashing dot here and you look at the, you sort of attend to the yellow dots, you'll see them probably, most people, uh, disappear uh, with some level of frequency. And when they disappear, and for you, it's different from your neighbor because there's nothing happening to the yellow dots, believe it or not. This is all going on inside your head. And there have been experiments that show that there's no blockage of this information in the eye. It really does get passed into the brain. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah, you made it worse. Made it worse. Uh-oh. I made it worse? Yeah, worse. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Uh-oh. Take it easy. <laughs> there are no keys there. You turn those lights on. Can you turn the lights down in the room, please? I'll talk about something else for a moment. Um, we so want to turn the lights down. The, the converse of that, which we don't need the lights down to appreciate, is dreaming. So in, in the case of dreaming, you have sort of the opposite case where you don't have any input through the eye at all, but you have visual experiences, you see colors and you're running through familiar places, usually in your underwear for reasons I don't really understand, but you have a lot of visual experience without any input. So there's really a dissociation between what you see and what information enters the brain, and that's uh, not very controversial. Now, uh, as I pointed out, the, the primate visual cortex, and by primate I mean humans, we're primates, and our monkey cousins um, have a huge amount of our brain dedicated to the analysis of visual images that are ultimately getting passed into the brain through these retinal ganglion cells. And uh, the, I'm only going to really talk about a small subset of things, but here are the retina again. You've probably heard this a, a bunch already, and I'll, I'll say it a couple more times. It gets passed through this lateral geniculate nucleus, which is very important for my talk, and into this primary visual cortex, also called striate cortex, also called area V1. And the rest of these colored regions correspond to about 50% of the primate cerebral cortex that is in one way or another dedicated toward visual processing. So we have a very visual brain. So um, I study non-human primates, macaque monkeys, and so we, as, uh, as Wynn pointed out, a lot of what we understand, um, both a basic science level and a medical level, about the functioning of the brain comes from research in macaque monkeys, and particularly with respect to vision, because we have essentially inherited the same visual system as macaque monkeys did uh, from a common ancestor that lived about 25 million years ago. So I'm just going to give a, a sort of simplified version. Again, information coming from the retina through the lateral geniculate going to V1, and I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, visual areas. Looking at it in terms of this sort of visual hierarchy, you have information coming up through here, getting to V1. And I'm just going to fill in a couple of areas. Just again, this is uh, almost insulting to people who study this in great detail, but this is sort of the skeleton for the purpose of this talk. You have information that goes to these different uh, uh, other lobes within the brain, and you have another set of pathways that goes through another thalamic nucleus called the pulvinar. But what you really have to just pay attention to right now is just this. This is the main highway, the optic tract going into the LGN, and then the optic radiations going into the primary visual cortex. So one question that one can ask is, uh, well, let me, let me first show you uh, an experiment that we did in my lab that allows us to visualize this pathway in a very nice way. It takes advantage of an almost miraculous property of the salt manganese chloride. Um, for reasons that are almost too good to be true, manganese chloride is taken up by cells that think it's calcium. It's transported in these long axons. And then, amazingly, it's visible in MRI. So if you, if you inject manganese and you wait a couple of days, um, so basically we, we go in here, we find the lateral geniculate nucleus, we inject uh, manganese in a, in a pool there, and then we wait a couple of days, and then we can image it using MRI. And this is real data. We inject here, and this shows the optic radiations in a, in a sagittal section and a horizontal section 
um, that passes this manganese chloride molecules back into the primary visual cortex. And so that's the pathway visualized in the macaque monkey. And so now, this is a very prominent pathway. You'll see there's not much else. It kind of goes from there into the primary cortex. And then you can ask the question, well, <coughs> what if this is such a prominent pathway, can we see without, the, without V1, without the primary visual cortex? So here, primates are a little bit different from other mammals. If you look at this evolutionary tree of different mammals, what you can see, this is uh, from uh, basically all the mammals. A subset of these mammals have, over the last 50 years or so, been tested in terms of whether they're able to see without their primary visual cortex. And nearly all of the animals on this chart that have been tested, I mean, representing, representing the different clads that are on this chart, um, are able to see pretty well even when their primary visual cortex is damaged. There's only one area here, and this is uh, humans and other primates, where damage to the primary visual cortex is devastating. It makes you blind in that part of visual space. And that's because uh, in, in primates, more than other mammals, there's a funneling of visual information through this uh, striate cortex in a way that in other mammals, it's more spread out in other secondary cortical areas. So um, what, is, what does that mean in terms of our being able to see without the primary visual cortex? Well, to, to talk about our understanding of human vision and area V1, we actually have to go back to World War I, where a lot of the organization of the primate visual, primary visual cortex was determined through bad reasons, um, through injuries. So in World War I, there was improvements in weapons technology. Um, the bullets were flying faster, and sometimes there was some somehow cauterizing tissue as they were flying through. And the, the consequence of that is you had more survivors from bullet wounds. So that's one factor. Another factor is um, that so area V1 is back here in the human. Um, American helmets looked like that, and uh, British helmets looked like that. And as a result of that, there were a number of British soldiers in World War I that had bullet wounds to the occipital cortex that survived and then could be tested by a neurologist. And we learned a lot about um, area V1 um, because of that. Now, one of the things that came through that kind of testing was the sort of mapping of space. So just like the retina, uh, V1 is a map. Um, and if you injure one part, you'll have a defect in one part of the visual field. And if you move injure a slightly different place, it'll be in a different part of the visual field. Another thing is what I'm going to focus on, which is um, a strange dissociation between different aspects of vision that was noticed um, around the time that they first started studying V1 and then kind of forgotten. But early on, uh, 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 Captain George Riddock um, in, the, in the British Army, I believe, um, studied a number of patients that were injured in Gallipoli. Uh, this is one patient uh, that was injured on June 6th, 1915, almost exactly 100 years ago. And it was, he was uh, injured by bullet wound in the occipital cortex. And during the first examination, which was a couple of months after the surgery, I should mention that um, this patient was not rendered unconscious by the injury and also did not report any visual problems whatsoever. But when he was, which is not that atypical, which is interesting, but um, when he was tested in terms of his parametric um, performance by uh, this, this doctor a couple months later, um, it was clear that he was able to see form, like objects and movements in this part of the visual field, but not over here. And so he had what's called a scotoma over here. He wasn't able to see anything as far as the doctor could determine. The patient returned to Dr. Riddick uh, a few months later, and he noticed something peculiar, which was that, okay, the, the basic visual scotoma was about was it where it had been, but now the patient, when, when the doctor wiggled his fingers, he could see a little something. He couldn't say exactly what it was, but he could tell there's something going on there. It's a sensation that maybe even is hard to understand for us, um, but there was some capacity to see some kind of something in that part of the visual field. And when the patient came back uh, a few months after that, this had stabilized. There was this region, region in here where he was able to see that, and then there was a complete scotoma more centrally where he wasn't able to see anything, including motion. And then he came back again, and it looked like this is more than a year after the initial surgery. 
So that was uh, something that was uh, un uh, understood and, and studied. Um, and then for a long time, I think it kind of stood still. That's my sort of historical reading on this, although it's, it's easy to underestimate the large amount of research that was done and forgotten. But where it kind of picks up again in terms of where modern accounts of uh, V1 lesions and, and these weird phenomena comes in uh, is in the 70s. And in the 70s, uh, people revisited what are the effects of <laughs> lesions in both animal models, monkey models, and in terms of human patients. And I'll show you a couple of examples again of the dissociation that one has between uh, perception, uh, our conscious awareness, so we believe, and uh, certain kinds of behavior. So first, um, this is a monkey named Helen that was given a, a occipital lobe bilateral lesion, I think, in 1968 or something. And this it was seven years before that, so I guess that makes it 67. Um, and after about seven years, uh, the animal sort of stabilized and was able to perform a couple of different types of things, was able to navigate a very high contrast place where she was walking, and was also able to catch raisins as long as they were tossed onto a table. So it's kind of almost looks sort of normal, but what was totally unable to recognize objects or even dodge patterns of light, this kind of thing. It was only when there was a little bit of motion or this navigation type thing where she was uh, showing some kind of normal visual performance. Um, more recently, an analogous patient has been demonstrated. Um, this is a patient walking through, uh, this is a bilateral occipital lesion patient who claims that he has no awareness of his environment, but is nonetheless able to walk around the uh, various obstacles. Um, in this case, I think the monkey is holding the camera. I'm not sure why the camera work is so bad. Um, but... Uh, but again, this is making the point that, uh, again, there's this uh, dissociation between what is seen and what the patient's performance is. Now, in the uh, 70s, um, there, there have been other testing related to this, and it was given the term blind sight, and where they wanted to see, basically, could patients that had no awareness, was there a regime in which they really said, I don't see anything, but they're still able to, uh, to answer questions, use their visual uh, visual information in a guided way. And it turns out the answer is yes. So the doctor says, um, okay, which direction is this moving? And the patient says, what are you talking about? I told you I can't see anything there. It's like, no, don't you see anything? No, I don't see anything. Well, just guess. Okay, it's moving down and to the left. Correct. Okay. And then the next trial up and to the right. Correct. And so like, in that way, um, this, the details of this are not so important, but this is just an example of what that looks like. Um, for, for certain kinds of stimuli, often moving stimuli, there's a, a regime over here where the performance is very high, above 80%. But this is specifically on trials where the patient says, I did not see a stimulus. But then they nonetheless guessed, it, guessed its direction correctly. And uh, this kind of phenomenon called blind sight was also demonstrated in monkeys where you obviously can't have a verbal report. But you can train a monkey to say, first, do you see something? And then second, well, whether or not you see something, you have to move your eyes to your best guess. And when they did this kind of thing, they again showed that there's a dissociation for parts of this place where the V1 had been eliminated. The monkey says, I don't see the stimulus there, but nonetheless, they could move their eyes accurately to the position. So again, this dissociation between uh, perceptual performance and visual awareness. So where do you get talking monkeys? <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it takes them longer to, to train them in that way. Uh, I see. Uh, Okay, so this is, that's sort of the preamble. I have just a short piece of the research we've done in my lab that relates to one aspect of how this unconscious vision um, works. And this is in the experimental model of blind sight, which has been carried out by a number of investigators, including here at NIH, long before I was uh, involved in this, Bob Wirtz, for example. Um, and basically, um, here the, the paradigm is if you very carefully and precisely remove a portion of the primary visual cortex, it, it renders uh, vision in one region of visual space. Uh, you, uh, the, the monkey can't see there anymore. I didn't phrase that very well, but you know what I mean. So this is basically uh, the result of one operation, and here's what it looks like in the MRI afterward. You've removed V1 very precisely from one part of, uh, corresponding to one part of the visual field. So then uh, you ask the monkey, um, I want you to now tell me when you can see a visual stimulus. And you can, um, you can present the stimulus either in the scotoma or outside the scotoma. 
um, like this, uh, where but there's just a little dot, or you can present a different kind of stimulus. I'm just going to talk about flashing a light, simplest stimulus possible. Um, and the monkey has three different conditions, and he has to just move his eyes to the target under conditions where he sees it, and then hold his fixation centrally when he doesn't uh, see anything. And so when we do this, what we find is that after the surgery, for the first two months, the monkey can't see anything inside the scotoma and has perfect performance outside the scotoma. But after about two or three months, what we see is that if the target's outside the scotoma, he sees 100% of the time. Uh, if there's no target, he always responds by keeping his eyes fixed on the central point 100% of the time. Um, but then, if you present the stimulus into the scotoma, so this is now reaching higher visual centers without going through V1 because that's been removed, now he starts to, for higher contrast, he starts to respond on some subset of the trials. Depending a little bit on monkeys, it could be up to 50 or 60 percent of the trials. So now this is, this, this is not proving this blind sight dissociation I talked about before, but this is certainly vision without V1. And so that's what we're after here. So <clears throat> the question now is, okay, so given that, first, how much of the extra striate or the higher level visual cortex is activated under these conditions? And then secondly, can we say something about the pathway that's carrying that information? So the first question, um, if we go back to the skeleton here, this is the visual um, pathway here. So we're asking, does information get up into these regions up here? So to address that, we are over in building 49. There's a big vertical scanner that's dedicated for doing fMRI in monkeys. Um, the monkey sits in the uh, chair here, there's some mirrors, he looks at a screen over on top of his head, it's like a human sit-up uh, system, but he takes an elevator up into the scanner, so he's sitting up in here. And then we can do any kind of uh, visual stimulation, and the monkeys are trained to look at a little dot in the middle of the screen, or, or whatever the task happens to be. In this case, we do the same thing as in the behavioral testing. Um, now uh, we have them look at this dot, uh, that means we know that on the screen there's this region here that corresponds to the V1 lesion, but now we present a, a sort of dynamic stimulus in there, and we say, does the brain become activated, or to what extent does the brain become activated when we do that? So here's the side view of the monkey brain, and if we uh, take a portion here that's the sort of um, middle uh, visual cortex, and we flatten it just so we can paint activity on top of it, uh, what we end up finding is something that looks like this. So this is now a um, map of activity. Um, where this is a uh, high activity and this is and the background cyan is no activity and you have these punctate spots here where there's activity and these are in named visual areas that are important to us um, but the, the the important point is that even though v1 is gone this activity is happening um, by some pathway that is circumventing <coughs> v1 it's getting there somehow. And we're believing that that's supporting the monkey's ability to perform this task in some, some proportion of trials. So what are the low targets of this part right now? If we don't cut, what? Ah. Excellent question. Um, so I'll show you that. Um, so this is what I just showed you now, and this is the, le this is the normal case here. This is actually from the other hemisphere of the monkey. What you see is that there's a, there's a localization here, and that's because we're showing a relatively small stimulus. And so that makes sense in terms of the retinotopic position on here. This is what it looks like in the normal side. This is what it looks like in the other side. The difference is here in the scale. It's usually between a fifth and a third as strong of a response um, in the side where the V1 lesion is there. And that's quite strong. It's stronger than certainly we expected. So... Um, Basically, they're weak, they're weak in the lesioned hemisphere, um, but they're retinotopically organized, and they um, come about uh, two to four weeks, a little bit uh, longer in many animals, maybe up to three months in some animals. Um, and, and they tend to match the, the course of the recovery for the behavior. Um, so the extra striate cortex, these higher level visual cortical areas, continue to respond. Um, but, and then we ask the question, well, if V1 is not the conduit through which these visual signals are coming into the cortex, what is? And that's where we get to, we have to go back to the skeleton again and say, well, what did we do? Well, we took out V1, so it can't be any of these connections because we took them out. So now I have to tell you about a couple of things I haven't told you about yet. 
there are there are some more connections. There's a, a connection that Ed mentioned briefly through the colliculus and the pulvinar, and then there's another connection uh, directly from the LGN to higher level visual cortex. And we're going to come up with a couple of um, competing hypotheses, one of which I'll test and show you now. One is the collicular pulvinar pathway is carrying the visual signals from the retina into the cortex, and the other possibility is that what we're going to call the geniculo extra striate pathway, which is a mouthful, is carrying those signals into the cortex. Now, this is a very impoverished number of signals um, that doesn't give you very good vision, but it does give you enough to maybe localize an object. So this is this blind sight, and, and we think it's unconscious, which is also kind of an intriguing aspect of it. So in order to, to test this hypothesis, which is what I'm going to show you, what we did, we returned again to this case where we drove a, um, well, well, first of all, now V1 is gone. Uh, now we've put, again, into the LGN uh, a cannula, but now instead of injecting manganese chloride, we're injecting uh, a, an agent that temporarily silences activity within that region. So we want to say, can we affect either the behavior or the visual signals in the cortex in the V1 lesion animal if we then silence the lateral geniculate nucleus? So that looks something like this on this map. Now we just say, if we knock that out, does the performance and the activity go away? So here's the answer in terms of behavior. This is what I showed you before, OK? This is the monkey performing well up here and performing at high contrast in the, when the stimulus is in the V1 lesion portion there. If we now inactivate this other pathway, it goes away. So now the monkey can't see anything that's presented to that part of the visual field. So in terms of behavior, we think that that's what's supporting that behavior. If we then ask about the MRI side of it, let's look at that again. Uh, this is the map I showed you before. You have these punctate regions that are responding to the small stimulus that's in the scotoma. If we then repeat that experiment on the same day, but now have the uh, activity lessened in the LGN, that activity goes away. So that extra striator, higher level visual cortex response to the stimulus uh, is also dependent upon this LGN in the pathway. So if we put that together, we see these direct projections, which are pretty sparse. It's not completely clear how that can support this, uh, this behavior as being the important thing. And for reasons that would take a while to explain, we actually don't think it's the retina to LGN. We think that the colliculus has to be involved, and there are prominent projections from the colliculus to the LGN. So we, we, actually, whoops, we actually think that um, this is the pathway that the uh, information is passing in this unconscious uh, vision. So let me just uh, summarize it there and say that blind sight following V1 damage, uh, it provides an example of unconsciously guided visual behavior um, and the higher level visual cortex we see from the MRI experiments continues to receive information even though that information cannot be going through area V1. The residual neural responses and the blind sight behavior are contingent upon the LGN because when we inactivate it, both of those aspects go away. And uh, the, this pathway that supports blind sight is an example of, probably one of many examples, of how the brain unconsciously uses vision through its alternate uh, visual pathways. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Dave. Oh, do we have some questions here, Bob? You mentioned when there's a lesion to V1 that it obviously interferes with uh, human sight. Uh, is there any indication that if there is uh, a lesion in V1 that it also interferes with uh, your ability to dream and see as well during your dreams? I think it's a great question. Um, I think that it's, it's kind of... Uh, I think that there's no clear evidence that it does. I think there have been reports that it can, but it's very tricky because what you have to do is you have to get a dream report, and then you have to get almost something like a visual field composition of a dream report, and so I think it's not good evidence that it does. In case of a stroke in the visual cortex affecting brain, could we train the patient to use the blind side to see? So there's some efforts in that uh, regime. Uh, Crystal Huxlin, for example, is working on that. The bad news is that the answer is not very effectively. Um, 
where there has been a bit of progress is at the margins of the scotoma. They seem, if you, with a lot of training, more than you probably want to do, they can uh, move in a little bit more. So you get a slightly improved uh, ability to see there. And uh, does one nerve fiber, the retinal ganglion cell, goes all the way to the visual cortex? No. no so they, there are several segments. Yeah. So when you inject the manganese, after doing the removal of the visual cortex, how far does it go? Right. The so, manganese, does it diffuse? The so we haven't done exactly that experiment. It's technically difficult because if you remove a, a segment of the visual cortex, you can't be so precise with the injection of manganese to only target the part that's going to that segment. So you'd have to remove all of the visual cortex, and we, haven't, we just haven't done that. Thank you. Yeah, just a minute, Rocco. Okay. In an individual who's visually blind, that is, has no sight in his eyes, does he still have what they call vision, a mind's eye? Can they still see? Can they still dream? Uh, do they still imagine yeah. the seeing things? So, so nothing like blind sight. So they can't use visually guided information because the effectors are, but they certainly can dream, yeah. And I think it depends on um, when they lost their sight. But there, there, there are reports. I saw this fascinating talk. I wish I could remember the man's name. Uh, who lost his sight when he was 15 or something. And he has such a, a strong training, his own, by his own efforts to train himself for his mind's eye to say, that he would kind of imagine the surroundings around him and actually paint his own world um, based upon his experience. Uh, I, I've heard it said that uh, there's no grandmother cell. Like when I see my grandmother, a particular cell fires. But I... I still don't understand how we recognize people that we know in terms of these B levels, uh, given that we've never seen them in the same setting or with same facial and physical expression. So can you explain in terms of these V levels how we recognize people we know? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, but, but I will say that you've hit on, I think, one of the most important and unknown questions. So I will say that um, I'm about the same age as the concept of the grandmother cell. So they were, uh, well, it was a little bit later, but, but I was born in 1969, and they were doing the recordings that kind of led to that in that time. And um, our, it, it's kind of been modified a little bit to like, are there grandmother cells, or is it more of a distributed coding? And, but these are kind of not very helpful ways of answering your question because basically one thing is how is it that our perception of anything is invariant to all of the different conditions that we see it under and then the, the next question is okay so then what has to happen for you to recognize something right and so those are two parts of a great unknown about high level vision that people are working on but I we need good ideas <clears throat> Projection to the, um, the uh, is there any projection from the ganglion cell through the lateral genic nuclei to the blind side path? Is it more peripheral than central? So there's a subset of ganglion cells that are thought to contribute to more blind side behavior. Um, the peripheral versus central, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't, I don't know about that. The high concentration in central vision, which is mostly occupied by the parvocellular pathway, is probably not contributing to the blind sight behavior. So in a sense, it's more, it's less skewed than most vision towards central vision. Go ahead. David, in, in the normal animal, these two paths exist. Is there any evidence that the secondary path is used for something in the normal animal? So there's no evidence for that um, that I am aware of, and, but there's no evidence against it. You know, it's just that our, our visual experience is so, you know, it's very hard to think about it intuitively. You know, when you place your foot, are you using your conscious vision or your unconscious vision? When a, when a, when a deer scrambles up the side of a hill, the only sense he has for placing his foot is vision. I mean, there's some out of sensation to some extent, but like, and so... Is all of that the same stuff of conscious vision as when you're recognizing a face? So I, I don't think we have a really good answer to that yet. And if 
that aspect of our vision is unconscious, whether that's because it's taking a pathway like this or not, it's a matter of speculation. Go ahead. So I have a question. Now, given the fact that the blind sight path uh, goes around V1, and V1 is fairly early on in the, in, in the main pathway, is it surprising that it's an unconscious uh, vision pathway? It's not obvious to me why those signals shouldn't reach consciousness just because they bypass V1. Right, right. So um, we've been thinking a lot about that kind of question. You know, is, is V1 itself the important thing for conscious vision? I don't think that's the answer. Um, it, is it because of some threshold effect where there's just not enough visual energy? That could be an answer. Uh, is it because of the kind of information that's carried through these particular kinds of ganglion cells so, and, and going through a particular set of layers in the LGN? There's, there is some cell specificity I didn't talk about. The projections that are going to the colliculus, that are going to the LGN, that are going to the cortex, it's only one basic subset of information that's coming from the retina. Is that kind of unconscious information? So, uh, so uh, those are questions we don't really know. Sorry, I have a lot of we don't know answers, but. <laughs> okay, so what's the most non-invasive way to check or f check the flow of this information in, in other scenarios or uh, in terms of what's a less invasive uh, other than following, let's say, MNCL2 that you mentioned? Um, I'm not sure. You mean, so, what what are other techniques that you could use to follow the follow the flow uh, that you mentioned here about this particular pathway? You you had used MNCL2 to follow it, right? right. So are there other less invasive may, means to follow it? So you could try it for. I, I think I'm going to have to say no. You know, I mean, I I, I would love to say yes, but um, there's a there's a you know there's fMRI, which has some strengths and liabilities. There's, there are other more electrically based, you know, human methods, but um, they're very much less powerful than what you can do with invasive methods. So I wonder, in some of the unusual uh, disorders that you describe, Edmund, has fMRI been performed? Are those localizations you showed on your slide based upon, I don't know, autopsies, or are they, do they represent, like, the state of the diagnostic art today? Uh, we have, I, <laughs> I think in a couple cases, fMRI has been used in, in sort of, but most of these have come about because they, they had a localized stroke, they, or they did come to autopsy or something else. They, they had previously known what complaints they had, and they correlated the two. But yes, in some cases, fMRI has been shown that you know it's abnormal in these kinds of ways. Um, so what do you find in the Charles Bonnet syndrome? Um, I don't think it's any specific signal that, that you can you know, say this is what's abnormal um, that would give you insight into what's going on. Um, so the diagnosis is fundamentally I, I, a I clinical of, one, is that it's right? It's the when, gain up, essentially. If you have normal vision, it's it's um, the brain doesn't like to to exist in a, a vacuum in the sense that even with sensory deprivation, um, you know people will start hallucinating, um, and it's it's as if the gain is being turned up. It, it, without the inhibition of vision, the, the normal pathway, it'll actually create its own kind of images. Um, but again, this is hand waving in some sense. Um, is there a neurophysiologic uh, foot imprint of uh, hallucinations with after sensory deprivation? I'm not aware of it. I, I guess there probably is, but are there any other questions? Bob. Somebody asked about uh, grandmother cells, uh, but there's been a, a lot of advancement in the ability of computer vision face recognition going from terribly low to uh, actually quite reasonable. And they do it by vector space separation, eigenvalues, and, and the rest. So is there, in the biological viewpoint, the potential for grandmother eigenvalues? Right. So I mean, I, I think that what, what's inherent in your question is 
Um, the, so faces have natural statistics that produce a space that means that you wouldn't necessarily have to have a cell that just represents all of the details of a face. It could represent a dimension in that space. And I think that is the key to getting a little bit past this concept of grandmother cells. So yes, I think that the natural variation and the natural statistics of things like faces might even help us understand some of the invariance problems. If you can understand how a prototypical face responds to different lighting conditions and things like that, maybe that helps you understand individual faces better. OK, well, last question. Hmm? Mangan is very toxic. So what happens? Manganese is very toxic. So what happens after the imaging? Did the pathway you find, they kill all the neurons in the pathway? Um, at the, at the, it, there's been studies. We haven't done the studies, but people have studied whether the concentrations that we're using, I wish I remembered what they were, but uh, whether they kill neurons. And the answer is pretty convincingly no. I think the 100 millimolar is pretty toxic, but down at where we are, which is more, I don't know, maybe I can't remember anymore, but I think under these conditions it's not. Actually, they're starting to use it in um, some human studies now, so okay. same thing. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if not, thank you all very, very much. That was very exciting. Beautiful.